Hey there, it's Angela. I thought I'd pop in here even though the podcast is on hiatus for the summer because there's some stuff that I want to share that will be too late for you to hear in August when our regular episodes resume. I want to do a really deep dive in this special episode um, about envisioning positive change and a more resilient pedagogical approach in the way we do school this coming year. There are some uncomfortable truths that I think we need to discuss and some realities that I think we need to come to terms with and admit here in order to move forward. And I'm not going to shy away from that. However, I think that this episode is going to leave you feeling both encouraged and empowered to use your voice to help shape what teaching and learning are going to be like this coming school year. So before we get into things, I want to start with a quick announcement that the 40-hour teacher workweek program is now open and the July 2020 cohort is kicking off. So it's called 40 hour because the average K-12 teacher in the US is contracted to work around 40 hours a week. The systems in this program that I created help you maximize those hours so that you're not working endlessly on nights and weekends. So in the program, you get resources and support throughout each month of the year, starting in July 2020 and ending next June. And I'll be adapting the materials each month prior to their release so that you always have what's relevant and timely for whatever's happening in schools throughout the year. So if that's teaching remotely or a hybrid model or safe distancing in the classroom or any other new reality, we will help you streamline your workflow and help you stay focused on what makes the biggest impact for kids. So in 40 Hour, there is no pressure to keep up. Um, It's not an online course. You don't have to cram and do the whole thing this summer. That's why we space it out throughout the year to help you um, as you get to know your kids and as you get to know the circumstances in your school during the year, you can adapt it and implement the change slowly. We're going for permanent changes here, not quick fixes. So you don't have to do everything at once. You don't have to keep up. um, And you don't even have to turn in any assignments to us unless you're doing this for CEUs and your district requires that. So nothing to turn in. Just jump in whenever you want support. There's four sets of materials each month around a topic like lesson planning or grading or communication and documentation. So of those materials around that topic, you can either read the PDFs or you can listen to the audio versions and use the editable forms and templates to help you save time. You don't have to use everything to get results. There's really a wide variety of resources because everyone's teaching context is different. Just pick and choose the things that are most relevant to you. So the last day to get early bird bonuses is June 30th, and the last chance to join the cohort altogether is July 15th. You can go to 40htw.com, so 40htw.com to learn more, or click the link in the show notes. You can also just Google 40-Hour Teacher Workweek. We've had more than 32,000 teachers go through this program in the past, so you will find lots of info about it online. Now, what I'm going to share here in this podcast episode is actually part of a bonus resource that 40-hour members receive when they first enroll in the program. It's about how to prepare for fall when things are so uncertain. You know up until this point, if you're subscribed to my email list or you follow me on social media and you've seen the various messages that I've been pushing out, that I've really been advocating for teachers to use the first part of your summer break to rest and recuperate. And as we head into July now, I do want to plant the seeds for you to participate in the reshaping of schools that's happening right now in your district. I want to help you ensure that your voice is heard and that your school's plan for the fall is developed with your input and insight. Without support from actual classroom practitioners, whatever plan they have is not going to succeed. So we're going to dive into that much more in a moment. I do want to stress for those who haven't heard me say it, because I haven't actually said it yet on the podcast, that you deserve and need time for rest and for not thinking about school this summer. It is imperative every year for your mental, emotional, spiritual, physical health. And it's even more important this summer after months of crisis distance learning. Make no mistake, this pandemic has induced collective trauma on us as a nation. And the impact is not the same for everyone. And like all trauma, the effects are not going to be the same for every person. And also, sometimes you think you're doing just fine. And then you have a little bit of a breakdown later and you see how fragile you really were. Or sometimes the stress manifests through physical symptoms later on. And you realize, wow, this really impacted me in a lot of ways that I wasn't able to recognize at the time. So I implore you to use some of your summer to heal from that trauma. Take care of yourself. Recuperate after a very taxing spring. Do things that are restorative. 
for your mind, for your body, for your soul. Tend to the aspects of your life that you had to put on the back burner during emergency teaching. Focus on getting home projects taken care of and other things that you may not have had time to do during this past school year. The best way to prepare for fall, particularly when you don't yet have all the facts and information that's needed to prepare, is by really shoring yourself up mentally, emotionally, physically. Get yourself healthy and in a good headspace so that you're better equipped to handle whatever may come in the future. If you didn't get my summer planning guide that I mentioned at the end of the podcast season, it's not too late. I'll put the link in the show notes for this episode to that too. Um, the summer planning guide is part of the 40-hour teacher workweek materials, the June materials if you're a member, so you can access it there. If you're not a member, no worries. I make this available to everyone for free every summer. And I updated it for 2020 since I think the summer has a very different set of challenges. So the idea with the summer planning guide is that you create a solid yet flexible overview of what you want to do during your break. So you choose themes for each week of your summer break and you batch similar tasks. So there's time set aside for cleaning and organizing at home. There's time set aside for relaxation or staycation, vacation, whatever it is that you're doing, just family experiences, reading books, whatever's important to you, as well as working on back to school stuff. So if you're worried about whether you're going to have time for everything that matters, or if you feel like you just can't relax right now because there's all this schoolwork for fall hanging over your head, then use those summer planning guide templates to help you out. The link's in the show notes. See, I think personally that adapting to the changes this coming school year will be the biggest challenge of my career in education. And I'm guessing the same will be true for you. So the way that you set up your self-care this summer and the way you use your break now can help you feel more energized and rejuvenated for the hard work that is almost certainly ahead of us. Even though you may want to start preparing now or you feel like you should be getting ahead, whatever that means this year, please know that you don't have to do that right at this moment. There's no use attempting to solve problems before we even understand what they are. As hard as it might be, dismiss those anxious thoughts about the coming school year and resist the urge to prep too much right away. We just don't have enough information at this point, at least most of us don't, to envision what classroom teaching is going to be like in the fall. And you can end up creating double work by doing things now and then having to redo them all when circumstances change. Now, that said, now is the time to be giving your district leaders and administrators input as they create the plans for the coming school year. They cannot create workable policies and procedures without your support. They need your input, regardless of whether they're asking for it. I believe now is the time to be advocating for what's best for teachers and kids. Often teachers are made to feel that those two things are mutually exclusive, but I believe they're fully intertwined. If a policy or procedure works for teachers, but it isn't good for kids, then it's not the right solution, and we need to keep working toward a better one. But if something's good for kids and not for teachers, we can't stick with that solution long-term either. You know how I feel about this if you've been listening to the podcast for a while. I do not believe that teachers must do, quote, whatever it takes for kids when that whatever requires them to individually compensate for under-resourced and understaffed schools and inequitable systems. We need to change the systems, not place the burden for mitigating damage from those systems on the backs of individual teachers. I'm tired of teachers, and for that matter, administrators, being given impossible goals and then left to, quote, figure it out. And I'm wary that that's what's going to happen on an exponential scale this coming year. You can work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and spend your entire paycheck on resources for your students. And it's still not going to be enough to compensate for systemic problems and institutional barriers. It's just not. So what we're not going to do this year is add to that by making every individual teacher figure out their own logistics for the vague guidelines from politicians and other high-level, quote, leaders. We are not going to issue impossible mandates and then abandon principals and teachers to just make it work like they always do and then turn around and blame teachers for the outcome. That cannot happen in this situation. And we need to interrupt those longstanding patterns every time we see them. Resist this deflection of responsibility at every turn. I see what's best for kids and what's best for teachers as a Venn diagram with a huge overlap in the middle. 
The solutions I advocate for will always fall somewhere in the middle there, and I'm not willing to settle for something that only serves one or the other. Teaching conditions are kids' learning conditions. If teachers are stressed, kids are stressed. Teachers are not disposable resources to be used up and replaced. We are seeing a revival of workers' rights movements around the country right now for folks who are tired of putting their lives and their safety on the line without having proper compensation and resources and the support they deserve. This is not a time for teachers to just roll over and accept whatever they're told to tolerate this fall. It's not a moment in history where we're going to be doing that. I urge you to join in the fight for safe working conditions where you can protect your health and your students' health and do your job effectively and be compensated appropriately for it. So I've been thinking a lot about where I personally can add the most value to this work and and offer support and resources in the way that I do best. So I'm going to share part of a sort of manifesto here for you. These are my beliefs and goals that will shape the work that I do around COVID adaptations in the coming year. And you will see these perspectives interwoven into every resource from me this coming school year. The emails, blog posts, podcast episodes, social media posts, 40-hour workweek resources, everything. So one part of the manifesto is that we will be creating space for a broad range of experiences and feelings and possibilities. There's never been a one-size-fits-all approach to schooling, and that's even more true now. There is space for teachers to be excited and scared, optimistic and hopeless. There's space for students who are thriving without home learning and those who are struggling desperately. We'll respond to this range of reactions, not by attempting to standardize it or force people to conform, but by meeting them with empathy and grace and flexibility. We'll be focusing on a a one-day-at-a-time mentality rather than speculating about the future. Typically, with my resources, I try to help teachers plan and work ahead. And that will be true to an extent this year, but less so because we don't know yet what September will be like, much less December or February or April. None of us needs to figure out what to do six months from now. We're staying focused on solving today's problems so we have the energy left to solve tomorrow's problems when they come. Scenarios and learning conditions will likely shift multiple times throughout the school year, and we will prepare for each one as it comes. This preparation will be based on what teachers are learning and sharing about emerging best practices in their classrooms. And we'll be accepting that learning conditions will not be optimal this coming school year. And we'll choose resilient flexibility over idealism or even just normal protocols. So far, I've not heard any school district's plans for reopening in the U.S. that are without extreme drawbacks and potentially devastating consequences. There are no ideal options at this time. There's nothing that would allow us to teach the way that we would like to or in a way that's best for all kids. And rather than resist that reality, we are working with it, being flexible and adaptable and remembering that these challenges are temporary. School will not be like this forever. But holding ourselves or students to the old standards is simply not going to work from what we can see right now. And we cannot insist on idealistic standards when we're in a crisis. We must accept that the coming school year will be a diversion from how we'd prefer to teach and the optimal learning conditions for our students. There's no solutions that are perfect right now. So we're going to make the best of what we've got by focusing on maximizing whatever instructional time, resources, and opportunities we're presented with. Now, I do want to pause here and get really real with you about something. I'm going to say something that you may not hear officially from anyone in your district, but I believe it's the truth. As a teacher, I think it's likely that you will have to set aside a lot of best teaching and learning practices this school year, particularly if you work with younger students. Intentionally going against what you know about pedagogy and the neuroscience of how humans learn best that's going to create a lot of cognitive dissonance. There will be things that you have to do that you would never choose for your students outside of a global pandemic where they can't safely be in contact with one another. Kids may be confined to their seats more and moving less, interacting with each other less, not sharing manipulatives or books from the classroom library, or keeping six feet away from one another and from you. It will be heartbreaking for many teachers to undertake this challenge. 
it has the potential to break many teachers' spirits and drive them from the profession. If that's how you're feeling right now, please know you're not alone. This is a really, really hard ask for people who care about kids. And yet I think the willingness to diverge from our known best practices is going to be necessary because we have to move into a different set of best practices that are based on the current circumstances. I don't know if this is an accurate analogy, but I just keep thinking about a medical professional working in wartime or some other health crisis that puts them into triage mode. Doctors are trained to do everything they can to help every patient, but when you're working in triage, you simply can't offer the full spectrum of resources that you normally would. You have to make some trade-offs. The quality of care and the choice to not offer care wouldn't be acceptable in optimal conditions, but those sacrifices are the only way that triage works. And I think teaching is going to be a little bit like that this year, at least from what it appears to right now from my perspective in mid-June. To make this work in the fall with minimal harm to yourself and your students, I believe there's two things that you need to be willing to do. The first is practice radical acceptance, and the second is participating in the reimagination of schools with resistant flexibility. So let's dive into what that means here. Begin by accepting that kids need to be collaborating and playing together and socializing in ways that they cannot do in school this fall. Accept that the best practices that you've built your whole teaching philosophy around will be largely impossible as long as we need to safe distance from one another. Accept that the relationships you build with students this fall will not be able to develop in the usual ways or in the ways that you would prefer. It's going to be different than that. Accepting this is radical acceptance. Remember that from episode 176? It doesn't mean that you think the situation's okay or that we pretend that it's not problematic. Radical acceptance is just being brave enough to see and accept things exactly as they are. No denial. This is what the situation is, not only in schools, but in our lives right now. None of us is able to do everything the way we prefer in this moment because we have to take additional health precautions for COVID. When you can accept a situation exactly as it is, you can then say, here's the reality of what I'm dealing with. What thoughts, words, and actions can I choose to make the situation better? It's okay to be in denial for a while. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be frustrated and hopeless. It's okay to hate that this is happening to kids and teachers in our profession. If you can eventually settle at least sometimes into that place of radical acceptance, even if you can't stay there every moment of every day, I know I can't, that radical acceptance is a place where you can see the limitations clearly and accept them. That's where you'll be able to make better choices about how to mitigate the damage. Because then you're not draining all your energy away into complaining and denying and resisting reality. So practice radical acceptance and use that to help you participate constructively in the reshaping of schools this fall. You see, the limitations and obstacles we'll be facing, which are simply piled on top of the pre-existing inequities and problems, they're going to be massive. And we have to mitigate the damage. We can't just take away all the stuff that was great for kids and say, oh, well. We can't just say, oh, it's terrible for them. What are you going to do? We must reimagine schools. We have to find new ways to meet kids' needs as best as we possibly can. Now, I'm going to wait and say more about this. Uh, it's something that I'm calling resilient flexibility. I'm going to do a future episode about it, probably the first episode of the season in August, because I think this concept really deserves a deeper dive. I sent an email out this past Sunday to folks about this concept, and I got a reply from a teacher named Cindy Ravel, who had encountered some ideas emerging around resistant flexibility online. Michigan State University is using the terminology resilient pedagogy, and I really like that. That word resilient it just implies a, a release from those old rigid approaches that weren't meeting the needs of all learners before. So the article that Cindy shared with me had also linked to a Twitter thread um, from Joshua Eiler, who said, quote, essentially, resilient pedagogy is a combination of course design principles and teaching strategies that are as resistant to disruption 
and to change in the learning environment as possible. Now, when I started reading about all of this, I immediately got so excited because it meant that someone else had put a name or a term to all of the ideas that were floating around in my head. I'm very excited about thinking through this idea of what it means to teach with resilient flexibility, which was the term I was thinking of, or resilient pedagogy, which is something else that I think is a fantastic term as well. I will be using this whole approach in the research that I do in this area as the basis of the advice that I give in the 40-hour teacher workweek materials, as well as the lens that I'll use to shape the podcast episodes coming up this year. What this looks like in my mind is creating one version of your lessons that works both face-to-face and online. It won't matter if you're teaching in your classroom or online next week, or if some of your students are at home and some are in the classroom with you, because you have a plan that works for any scenario. What I envision is creating structures and frameworks that can be reused over and over again, not only throughout this school year, but for many years to come, because they are flexible and resilient to circumstantial change. So I think this approach is at the intersection of what's best for teachers and what's best for kids. It's best for you because you don't have to create multiple versions of every lesson and redo things last minute with COVID changes. This is by far the most manageable approach to teaching that I can imagine for the coming school year. It is absolutely untenable to ask teachers to create online lessons and face-to-face lessons, much less conduct them both simultaneously. Resilience pedagogy simplifies the workload for teachers. And it's best for kids because it provides consistency and helps ensure that kids have equitable access to learning, whether they're at home or at school. Accessibility is at the forefront with resilience pedagogy, rather than simply covering content or rigidly adhering to the curriculum or the expectations. It's a more trauma-informed approach as well because it's flexible and responsive to kids' needs. And it's an approach that helps ensure better equity so that the most vulnerable kids don't bear the brunt of the challenges ahead. Now, again, I'm going to flesh all of this out more on the podcast in August, and we're going to be doing a deep dive into this approach in the 40-hour program beginning in July. I will link to some excellent resources right now for some folks who are already sort of digging into this. Um, So just click through from the show notes if you want to learn more about what I'm finding in my research. But what I want you to take away from this for now is that a reimagining of schools is required right now. And that is a good thing. It's not like the old ways of teaching and learning were so manageable for teachers or so beneficial for students. We needed a complete overhaul of systems. And though this isn't the catalyst for change that anyone wanted, it is an opportunity to create massive change very quickly. And that opportunity rarely happens in schools. I did a whole podcast episode this spring about this called Schools Are Closed. This is our chance to reimagine them. That's episode 192. You may want to re-listen to that now and think through what it might imply for you for the fall. We also have episode 196. That was about how some parts of teaching and learning are better now, particularly for some individual students and groups of students. You know, it's hard to believe for the ones who are struggling, but there are kids who are much happier and healthier learning from home. And I think that says a lot about how the traditional ways of doing school were just not serving a lot of children. So I think that we can embrace the possibility for positive change here and work to make sure the new approach to teaching is moving in the direction that you want to see. There's lots of positive stuff that's already coming out of this and that will come out of this. So that sort of leads us to the final piece in my manifesto. That was a major diversion that I just did there. (laughs) But the, the last part of my objectives and beliefs about the work that I think is needed right now is that we will be empowering teachers to help reimagine what schools will look like this year. Now more than ever, it is essential for teachers to speak up on behalf of themselves and their students, rather than waiting to be told what to do and resigning themselves to whatever's mandated. I urge you to leverage the current circumstances to have a bolder voice in how your school operates. Be in communication with your administrators about what's going well and what's successful. You're gonna be working hard and experimenting a lot to find emerging best practices. Make that hard work visible to your administrators. Share what you're learning. Communicate about what's working well for kids and what's not. Speak up for your needs, knowing that the success of this school year is largely dependent on your input 
even if you're not being asked for that input. You must be prepared to actively participate in the changes that are coming because whatever's happening on day one of school is going to be shifting. If things are a disaster the first few weeks, you can work with colleagues to compile suggested changes and go to your administration with new solutions. Absolutely nothing is written in stone right now. Nothing is permanent right now in the way we do school. So take advantage of that opportunity. Use it to create change that's ultimately better for you and your students. There's going to be a lot of shifting policies and procedures, so be prepared to experiment and share your findings with others in a constructive and solution-oriented way. I believe this shakeup can eventually settle into something that's better for teachers and kids than our old ways of doing school, but that's only going to happen if classroom practitioners like you get to participate in the reshaping. Now, that doesn't mean complaining or tearing down all possible ideas because none of them are perfect. It means responding as the degreed, experienced professional that you are. It means knowing your own worth and value and leading from a place of confidence. You know what goes on in your classroom better than anyone else, and you have the ability to find workable solutions and bring them to the table for others. I don't know what kind of guidance or support you'll receive from your school this year, but I promise to stand in the gap where needed and offer resources to help you figure out the logistics so you have the best possible chance of success this year. This week, I'm finalizing the July materials for the new cohort of the 40-hour teacher work week. We will be creating resources for simplifying your workload and streamlining your systems during COVID because work-life balance is going to be more important now than ever. Each month prior to the release of the next set of resources, I'll be making adaptations. So everything's timely. It's going to include hybrid models, staggered schedules, safe distancing. Whatever's happening in your local area, you'll be covered. So if you haven't joined that community, get in now for early bird bonuses and get all those back to school resources on July 1st so you can jump in whenever you're ready to start planning. Go to 40htw.com to learn more. I'll also be working on weekly Truth For Teachers podcast episodes again soon, so you'll be able to hear lots more about reimagining schools and what that looks like in practical terms. Make sure you're subscribed in your podcast player app to get the latest content downloaded to your mobile device automatically. I also send an email to more than 94,000 teachers every Sunday evening. It's just a message of encouragement and support. It's typically different from the podcast content, or sometimes it shares a slightly different angle or a different anecdote. So if you would like, you're welcome to receive those weekly messages as well. Go to the cornerstoneforteachers.com, and there's an email sign up at the top of the page. You can also click the link in the show notes. So those are a couple things that I will be doing to help support you through this. And now I think you understand a little bit about um, what I'm thinking and what I believe is needed and the right path forward, what I'm imagining for us. I want you to know that whatever happens in the fall, you don't have to figure it all out now. And you don't have to figure it out alone. These are systemic issues. We need systemic solutions. This is not all on you individually to figure it out. And you have to interrupt that pattern anytime you see all of that responsibility being placed on individual teachers. So don't do this alone. There's community, there's support, you've got colleagues, hopefully you have a union. Band together, gear up. That might mean working right now, it might mean resting. Make the most of your summer, whatever time you have for a break. Know that we're going to get through this school year together when the time comes. You know, I'm going to be real with you here. There is tremendous work ahead, but I think we can come out of this with a way of doing school that's completely reshaped. Change comes in schools very slowly, but the progress we can make right now can happen at an exponential speed. Leverage this time to help shape the kinds of schools that you want to teach in. Do not let people outside the classroom, even me, make the decisions for you about what teaching and learning will be like. And don't let the push for equity and racial justice fall to the wayside. That is interwoven with everything we're working toward this year. It is an absolutely essential, non-negotiable part of reimagining schools and to what they need to be. These new ways of teaching and learning must be trauma-informed. They must be anti-racist. We must work to reshape schools in a way that meets the needs of all kids, including those who have been marginalized 
and overlooked and discriminated against in the old ways of doing school. As I said in the beginning, this is probably going to be the biggest challenge of our educational careers. But I believe we were created for such a time as this. I keep thinking of that song from Hamilton, how lucky we are to be alive right now. You know, that wasn't said because it was a beautiful, peaceful, easy time. They were in the midst of a revolution. And we are too. The pandemic is shifting the ground beneath our feet. We can long for the old ways, which weren't really serving all kids and teachers anyway, or we can step forward boldly into the uncertain and co-create something better. This is going to be hard work. And I still have moments where I feel like things are impossible and that nothing short of a miraculous disappearance of COVID will make this school year tenable. I swing from wildly optimistic and hopeful to completely discouraged. It's tiring for me, and we've barely even started. And that's just what the experience of life is like for us collectively right now. I'm talking beyond just schooling, just dealing with the pandemic in general. It's a lot. It's exhausting. And we're not even unified as a country about goals and methods for staying safe. It's so frustrating to me. And on top of that, we have an extremely polarizing election coming up this fall. The next six months in particular are not going to be easy for America or anywhere else. So the question will be, are we just trying to survive? Or are we reimagining systems to make our world better? Things are going to be difficult and uncomfortable regardless. So will we simply tolerate that and try to make it through while other people make decisions about our future? Or will we actively participate in co-creating a society that we want to live in, one that's equitable and just for all people? Will we rise to the challenge and take this pain and heartache and use it as fuel to reshape our schools into the kind of learning environments that kids and teachers deserve? How lucky we are to be alive right now. What an opportunity we have before us. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.